Your task today and in this third section of the Speaking for What's Right project is to find rhetorical devices in your speaker's speech. Just as you found appeal to pride in the preamble of the Constitution, just as you found allusion and repetition in the Gettysburg Address, and just as we found anaphora in I Have a Dream, I want you finding these devices in your own speeches. The rhetorical devices document gives you a list of the ones that I would like you to find. Are there other rhetorical devices besides these? Of course. I could have doubled this list, but I tried to keep the list relatively short, especially filled with those that you probably already know. You already know rhetorical question. In fact, who here is dealing with a speech where the title itself is a rhetorical question? Thank you, Rissy. Ain't I a woman by Sojourner Truth. So I think Rissy's found her first rhetorical device in her speech. She only needs to find two. Half her work is done. I'd like you reading your speech, finding these rhetorical devices. Keep this document open. And then what you will do is enter them into this outline. The outline was designed by me to keep your ideas straight for writing a draft. So when I ask you to analyze, when Maddie's sitting there at a computer and she says, okay, I've got to write like 400 word analysis of this speech, what do I do? She's going to have her outline right there and she's going to say, which speech do you have? You have any I a woman also. So she'll say, well, I have um, my notes here that says, say, rhetorical question. And I've got one piece of evidence and another piece of evidence. So she has her material she needs to write her draft. She's in good shape. That's what you're doing today. You're filling out the outline that will help you write that draft. Look at the blanks. Here, you type your device, rhetorical question. Here, you give an example, piece of evidence. Here, you give a second piece of evidence, a second example. Will you quote? You could. Will you merely paraphrase? You could do that as well. Can somebody define the word paraphrase for me? Not quoting it. There you go. Thank you, Marcel. Putting it into your own words. So if you find a device that's basically one big paragraph, don't quote the entire paragraph. Just put it into your own words. Students today in first and third period seem to have no problem finding at least two rhetorical devices in their speech. We were looking at basic analogies. We saw metaphors. We saw similes. We saw appeal to, peer, to fear. We saw appeal to pity. We saw anecdotes. Um, we saw connotation. Um, what else? Anaphora. We saw. We saw just basic repetition. We've seen intelligent uses of voice. We've seen a lot over two class periods, and this is all students finding them themselves without my guidance. So I have no, no doubt um, that you'll be able to do that. Here's what I'd like you to do. For the next 15 minutes, I would like you reading your speech and finding devices. Here's all you need to fill out at this point. Device, evidence, evidence. Device, evidence, evidence. Notice that I've placed a third blank there, but I say you, you only do that if you need, if you want to. It's not required. So if you say, hey, I've got a third piece of evidence here, I'll put it in there. What would that do for you? Make it easier to write more sentences. But you're not required to find two pieces or three pieces of evidence. You're only required to find two. So again, for the next 15 minutes, I'd like you reading your speech, consulting this and finding examples of rhetorical devices. I have a model example written into the analysis outline from my Reagan Berlin speech. Feel free to look at it. But my experience today has been that you guys are doing this fairly well. Take those 15 minutes. Feel free to ask me questions if you're unsure about what you've identified. OK, so let's 
pick this up by seeing what some of you have found. And as I talk to students about their examples, I want to show you how those examples become sections of the outline. I want to show you exactly where I expect you to be with the outline and um, what your homework assignment will be and what we'll do tomorrow with the outline. So let's start with, um, okay, let's start with Sojourner Truth, Ain't I a Woman? And obviously, Ricky has an example of rhetorical question. Let's see how Rissy would complete the analysis outline for her rhetorical devices. Notice, by the way, she has typed her title there, Ain't I a Woman, although you misspelled woman. Seems to be a weakness of students. Rissy, that's not just you. But remember, that's women that you've got. All right, so she has voice as one of her devices. Voice means that Rissy is focusing on the use of first, second, or third person voice in the speech. And Rissy, can you tell me where you noticed um, her manipulating voice? Okay, so she's using the first person voice, right? We have I and my. Ain't I a woman? Um, if my cup won't hold but a pint. So she's using a lot of first person voice, but where do you see a shift in something else? Where does she use yours? This is interesting. Very few of your speakers will use a second person voice. Why? Because it's like pointing a finger at somebody. And people don't like to be pointed at. But she's doing it. So Rissy has something interesting, a shift from first person to second person. Let's go back to the analysis out. What she would do is she would type voice or even voice shift. And her first example would be the first person voice. The second example would be the second person voice. And if you watch, Rissy has basically done the same thing that I did with my Reagan Berlin speech. Look. I have first person, I, 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 and then first person plural, we. As I read my Reagan speech, I noticed he wrote an entire paragraph in first person voice, and then he shifted to first person plural. He shifted from the I to the we, and that was interesting to me. Rissy should be interested in the fact that Sojourner Truth works so much with I, but then she throws the you into it also. So she types this. Her evidence would be, in this case, probably just a quotation. I would just copy and paste some quoted material. And uh, copy and paste an example of first person voice and copy and paste an example of second person voice. And then she's doing it correctly. She's highlighting quotation because that's what she will use. Let's move to Jessica's. Jessica is working with Steve Jobs commencement address at Stanford. And which device had you found, Jessica? And that code. Yep. Very good. An anecdote is a little, it's a brief little story with actual characters and people. It's somebody telling a little story. Like every once in a while, a teacher will break into an anecdote. They might tell a funny little story about their own life or something that they have in their experience to bring to you. So they're little stories in the overall speech. Jessica says that she has an anecdote. She has paraphrased. Why did you choose paraphrase? Oh, you chose quotation for the other one? Um, what would make the decision between a paraphrase and a quotation? Can somebody define paraphrase for me again? What do we have for paraphrase? Putting your own words. Putting in your own words. Why would you put it in your own words instead of quoting it? True, but Steve Jobs is probably speaking in a way that's easily understood. See? 
So I don't think we really need to paraphrase Steve Jobs, but I think that Jessica should for another reason. It's too long. If her example is an entire paragraph, she needs to paraphrase it because you don't want to quote an entire paragraph. The reader might as well at that point read the speech and do the work on their own. The point is that you are condensing all this and bringing it to them. I like this. In the first paragraph, he tells his adoption and college story. I would change these other pieces of evidence to paraphrases also. I think that's better because you're summarizing the entire paragraph, right? So switch those to paraphrases and you're good, Jessica. Um, anybody working with FDR Pearl Harbor? Rachel, you are, right? And Grant, you are? Grant, did you find anything yet? Yeah, I appeal to pity. Appeal to pity, excellent. And where do you have appeal to pity? Um, at the beginning, it says a meritorious government and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces from the Empire of Japan. Good. And especially that suddenly and deliberately attacked. Okay, so Grant, you're talking about an appeal to pity. <coughs> that usually makes me feel sorry for somebody, right? So let's think about that, folks. Look at Grant's example. Yesterday, December 4th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. There's something other than really pity that's being brought out. What is he trying to bring out in his audience? What emotion? Uh, possibly. He doesn't really want them afraid, though. They're already afraid. He doesn't need to build that. Uh, yeah, but that's a little bit more positive. I think that Grant's correct when he's talking about negativity. What does he want them to feel? Anger. So, Grant, it's not on our list of rhetorical devices, but I would say there's an appeal to anger here. Um, he wants his audience to feel angry, and he starts it right there. So call this an appeal to anger, and then give that example. Grant, are you able to find other examples of him making people feel angry? Okay, see if you can, because that's that will be your task now, is to say, okay, I've got to appeal to anger. Does FDR do that ever again in the speech? Find a second example, and you're good to go. Rachel, did you find anything? Yeah. Anaphora? Yep. Where do you have the anaphora? Good. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Hong Kong. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Guam. Good. You've got anaphora. Um, for Rachel's outline, Let's see what she wants to do. Good, anaphora. Actually, each one of those can be... Oh, does he repeat yesterday at the beginning of sentences? Yesterday, yesterday, yesterday. There's not as much repetition yesterday. There's more last night. So here's what you can do for the uh, outline. This can be one piece of evidence, and this can be a second. Okay? So actually, FDR provides five pieces of evidence. Just pick one of those <coughs> for number one and one for number two. And if you want number three, pick a third. That'll make it easier for you. Right? Okay, um, I tell you, I love the 90s pantsuit that she's wearing there, the pink one, that's fantastic. Um, but uh, Sydney, you've got what going on in her speech? Anaphora. And where do you have anaphora? Um, in the beginning of a lot of You've got I have met, right? I have met. 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 Gosh. Did you, you wrote in your biography that she was strongly influenced early on in her life by King, right? So obviously she takes some of his speech 
into her own by repeating herself. Does she do use anaphora anywhere else? Where else? Okay, let me find it. Okay, seven. Yeah, there you go. Okay. By the way, you notice how cool this is over here in Chrome? That when I do Control F, it'll give me the yellow band where the word is. Okay, so just go straight there. Yeah. Perfect. It is a violation, it is a violation, it is a violation. Excellent. Sydney's got two examples of an afro. Working well. All right, Brennan. Mob murder in a Christian nation. What do you got? Oh, uh, your device was rhetorical question, right? Okay, so which one are you focusing on? Why is my hair Got it. She has three rhetorical questions, apparently. And here's one. Why is mob murder permitted by a Christian nation? And her second follows right along. What is the cause of this awful slaughter? So Brennan has rhetorical question as a device and then two examples that he should quote. Quote directly, and he should. Take out your agenda books. Let me tell you what I want you to accomplish tonight. This is sort of your entry ticket into class tomorrow. If you accomplish this, you're ready for the next step. Many of you wrote in your agenda books that tonight's homework is to work on the outline. I'd like to make that more specific. So if you already have that entry, add to it. If you have that entry digitally, you can add to the entry here. When you work on the outline, I want you to find your two devices with evidence for both. Find your two devices with evidence for both. If you can do that, you're doing just fine. Two devices and evidence for both. That means that you will have filled in the blank here, here, and here. There's other material, like a topic sentence or this kind of sentence. If you want to go to that next step, you're welcome to. But I'm telling you that when you walk in here tomorrow, I want to see two rhetorical devices and two pieces of evidence for each one. And that way, you can make use of class time. Yes, Mustard. So, do you need evidence for well, two pieces of evidence for each? Yes, two pieces of evidence for each. Minimal. You can go more than two, but you must minimally present two. Questions? Cool. 